I pray, Lord, that you be honored and, Lord, that we'll be able to look up to you and, Lord, uh, think about your great name. And, Lord, I pray that you will touch our hearts today. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, I look, I call upon Charlie Epps, uh, who's going to come up with the word. Good morning. I'd like to start off this morning by asking a question. What are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to? I know when we were younger, some of us still are. We look forward to birthday parties and Christmas because we knew that something would be coming, that new bike, the new stuff, the better stuff. We look forward to those types of things when we were younger. As we got older, we look forward to the new types of to toys, right? Uh, Lord willing, I... well. I have the age of four drivers and teenagers at my house right now. Get, get a good look at this car, kids, because you're never getting a car like that from Dad. <laughs> you can hope, you can wish, but you can look forward to it. And uh, a job as well. Maybe your first dance, your first date, your first prom. Uh, I, think she was I think she was looking forward to this. I'm not sure the dad was looking forward to it too much. And then, oh, graduation. Is that something to look forward to? Done. Finally. Whether that's high school or college, it's behind you, and you're done. What else? How about the first day at work? I got cut off a little bit. Let me go ahead and read it to you. It says that he, uh, he writes an Excel macro. Today, to do a day's worth of work in seconds. Now he's no longer needed at the company. <laughs> so you're looking forward to that first job and making a big impression. I guess don't make too big of an impression is the moral of that story. But you're looking forward to that first real job. Anticipation, hope. How about being married? Big day, right? Big day. Looking forward to that and anticipation and hope and excitement. How about that first house? I bought my first house. I don't know if that's hope and anticipation or, oh, no, did you look at that mortgage? <laughs> you know? There's excitement in that, though, isn't there? How about your first child being born or your first grandchild being born? Just so happened that this grandma had her first grandchild born on her own birthday. Not bad. It's exciting, isn't it? Look forward to those things hoping in those things. Now, this is the first, the first and only time you'll ever see me put up something about the Red Sox. <laughs> I am not a Red Sox fan. But I, if you read a story in Sports Illustrated, it's put out, there was literally people, Red Sox fans, you don't understand, in, in New England, Red, Red Soxism is a religion. Okay? There was people literally on their deathbeds when Game 7 was happening, and they didn't, or not, when they clinched, I shouldn't say Game 7, when they clinched, and as soon as they heard the Red Sox won... Then they died. <laughs> you laugh, but it's, I'm serious. It's exactly how it happened. These people were literally on their deathbed, and they should have died before. Then they heard the Red Sox win, and then they died. It's true. People have their hopes and their, their anticipation and their desire wrapped up in these sorts of things. There's nothing wrong with hope and anticipation and desire. But I like to talk to you about something else that's going to happen. Take all that hope, all that anticipation, all that excitement, all that desire, and all those activities, and all those things, all those relationships. Take away all that makes it kind of anticlimactic. 
makes it kind of, oh, is that all that there is? A lot of of these people experience. Anything sad, any sin, take it all away and then take what you have left and all that excitement and anticipation and wonderfulness and let's do a math problem. Multiply that times infinity and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about when Jesus comes back. Really, it should be in every sermon, I think. It should be in every message. The word for that is called the rapture. It's called the rapture. Now, I've got some PowerPoints today. I did the best I could. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of these are kind of cheesy. Okay? But I want you to focus on the truths we're going to be talking about. The reality of Jesus coming back one day. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Is Jesus coming back? I get an amen? Amen. 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 All right. That's what we're going to talk about. It eclipses every other exciting thing you possibly imagine. I believe he could come back any day. I I believe he's going to come back soon. As we go through 1 Thessalonians, please open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're talking about hope. Hope in the Bible is not the same thing as hope in the world. People say, hey, hey, are the Giants going to win the World Series? I don't know. I hope so, which means I really have no idea, but maybe. Well, hope in the Bible is not like that. When you see the word hope in the Bible... It's a, it's a future event, but it's for sure. It is certain. Do you know why? Because it's based on God's promises. God's promises. When God says he's going to do something, even if it's in the future, it's for sure. And what is the, what is the great Christian hope? It's the rapture, that Jesus is going to come again. He's coming back, and his coming back will be awesome. And I hope many today will be encouraged by this fact. I hope many here will be emboldened. But in a real way, I hope many here will see no sizable change in their life by the time this message is done. I hope that it doesn't impact your life. Whoa, 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 preacher, you're supposed to talk to us about application and change our lives. And What do you mean you don't want it to change our lives? Well, we'll get to that later. I hope it encourages you But in a real sense, I hope it doesn't have a big impact in changing your life. I really think God wants us to hear this message this morning. You know, I've joked about before, you know, when it's time for me to preach, things just happen. I missed leading my first, maybe my second Bible study in almost 30 years the other Friday night from being sick. My water main busted for the second time in about a year. Um, I've had stomach problems. I've had a bad head cold. I mean, it just, it's the most busiest I've been at work in probably 20 years. We can't even get the drum set to work. <laughs> right? Premu, as faithful as can be, and we're losing the music. What's going on? Something's against this message. You know, we need to hear this message. I think we need to hear it every day. Jesus is coming back. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. 
You know, God wants brethren. God wants all sorts of brethren. He wants Baptist brethren. He wants uh, Lutheran brethren. He wants maybe, I don't know, charismatic brethren. There's only one kind of brethren God does not want. Ignorant brethren. Do you see that right there? I do not want you to be ignorant brethren. Okay? He wants them to be informed. He wants them to have understanding, right? These Thessalonians have been through a lot. It was the opposition that went from Thessalonians, chased Paul to the next city. But that's where these believers live, is with those aggressive people who are, who are uh, in opposition. And they need encouragement. You know what? Maybe some of them have died. Maybe some have died of natural causes. Maybe some have died out of persecution. Losing someone hurts. And these, these Thessalonians have done well, but he wants them to know you don't need to sorrow. You don't need to be sad like those who have no hope. Losing someone is hard. I went to five funerals in four years of high school, and God used it to open my eyes, to show me my own need of him. But as a believer, it, it's not the same. If you believe in a Jesus who died for you and rose again, you know he's going to raise that loved one up as well, the ones who sleep in Jesus. It's a sorrowful, it's a sad time, but not nearly as much as it could be. And we see throughout the, the, throughout the uh, book of Thessalonians, a, um, a theme of faith, hope, and love. It's the faith that's brought the Thessalonians through the persecution. And it's love that they were good at, that Alan talked about last week. We're going to talk about that 14 test out of 1 Corinthians 13 I thought was, was great. The test of do you, do you love? Are you a loving person? But now we're talking about hope. What, it, what is it? Well, we're going to talk about the etymology. What etymology mean? It means the, kind of where the word came from. The word came, comes from the word rapture, comes from some of the Latin translations, uh, Latin translations of verse 17, where it says caught up. Raptura is where it comes out in the Latin. To define what is the rapture, it is the catching away or removal of the church from earth when Christ descends from heaven and takes all believers home with him. It's a mystery. It was not known in the Old Testament. It's only shown in the New Testament. And here Paul says there's a direct revelation from the Lord Jesus. He said, I have a word from the Lord. He told me this directly. Reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's what the rapture is. And when does the rapture occur compared to other end times events? And that's what we have here. If you look at this diagram, you look to your left, you see the cross. That's supposed to picture when Jesus came the first time. Soon after Jesus left, the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church age, happens. That next event after the church age is the rapture. That's the era of the believers going to be with Jesus, meeting him in the air, as it says here. That's what we believe is going to be the next thing that happens. Um, many will understand these terms. This is a pre-trib, pre-millennial viewpoint. Before the millennium, you see there the far right, and before the tribulation, we believe the rapture is going to happen. There's other viewpoints Mid-trib, pre-wrath, partial, post. Uh, it's, not, it's not what we believe here. We believe Jesus is coming back soon. And really, he can come back at any time. What we see happening now is in the tribulation, which we'll be talking more about next week, there are end times events that are going to happen that include the nation of Israel. Well, before the 1940s, there was no nation of Israel. 
for hundreds of years. But now there is. Some of the things that happen in the end times that will happen during the tribulation period involve worldwide commerce. When have we ever been able to control worldwide commerce before today? Worldwide events being understood and seen as it were broadcast like we can today. So if those are things that will happen in the tribulation and the rapture happens first, then how soon is the rapture? Do you see? If the orchestra is tuning up in the orchestra pit, what does that mean? That means the curtain is going to get pulled back soon, doesn't it? What prophetic event needs to happen first before the rapture happens? There's not one that I know of. Not one. Jesus could come back. I was kind of, kind of hoping he'd come back before the message. Maybe he'll come back before the second message. Y'all just get to go home. So in the rapture, what's going to happen? As we read here, Jesus himself descends from heaven. Jesus is coming for you. Have you ever had anyone important want to talk to you and they show up at your door? Or they come and see you in person. I was studying in the intro program years ago. I might have told you this story. I was in the library and I left and I came back and I saw a little note. And it said, Charlie, do you want to come to dinner? Bill. It was, I kept that. One of the most memorable things I kept. It was Bill McDonald inviting me to dinner. He's such a godly, gracious brother. I always appreciated that about him. You're so important to Jesus that he himself is coming to get you. What do you say? I will come again and receive you to myself. Who is it? It's Jesus himself coming to get the believers. Where? We're going to meet him in the air. This is why it's different than what's going to happen later when we come with Jesus to the earth. We're going to meet him in the air. It says he will descend with a shout at the last trumpet. In Isaiah 42, it says that he will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. When Jesus was here the first time, he was, he was fairly sedate. He wasn't saying, look at me, look at me. He was telling people, okay, now don't tell anyone I healed you. You know, when Jesus comes back the second time, it's not going to be like that. He's going to shout. What is he going to shout? What did he say when he raised Lazarus from the dead? What did he say? Lazarus, come forth. Why is it important that he use the word Lazarus? If he didn't use Lazarus' name by itself, they all would have rose from the dead. (laughs) He'd say, come forth. They all would have came up. Right? What's he going to say? What's he going to say? He's going to say, Sanjay, let's go. What's he going to say? It's going to be a shout. When he speaks, that's power. There's power in his words. He speaks the creation into existence. He's going to speak our being raised instantly with power. Not the last trumpet, as it talks about in Revelation, but I think this is the last trumpet of the church. I'll give you a little story to try to help illustrate that, what I mean by that. Does anybody, anybody know who this is? About 60 years ago, there was uh, five guys killed in Ecuador. And uh, they were missionaries. And that little kid sitting there on the beach was the son of the pilot. And uh, I think the pilot's name was Nate, and his name was Steve. And that's his sister, Kathy. And they're being baptized. Right there in the middle, on the right side of the girl's right, is a uh, believer named Kimo. And closer to us, with his back to us, is a guy named Minkaye. And Kimo's sitting there with Steve on the picture on your right. 
Those two men killed his father, their father, those other four. And they later, later became saved. Um, and Steve was back there to do a documentary on it. Many of us have seen it. Many of us have seen it. The end of the spear. And uh, it just so happened, Steve Curtis Chapman was there at the same time with Steve, talking to Chemo and some, uh, just being there, working on some of the, the the things they needed to do for the video, the movie. And this is a story that happened. It said I invited Chemo to enter the long house with us. Unfortunately, Kevin someone working with them, could not tell us specifically where on the CD the music Kimo was referring to was located. Kevin started playing various pieces of the soundtrack. I couldn't remember enough what it sounded like to identify it. As the fifth or sixth piece started to play, uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman said, I think this might be it. And almost simultaneously, Kimo said, I saw lights like stars, and that is what I heard. Then he added, When I heard that long ago, I didn't know what it was. I was afraid. Hearing it, I knew we had done a bad thing there. Now, no longer living angry and hating, I see it well that you have returning brought this. They don't have a word for instrumental music. Back to us. So basically, he had heard music, and he said, when we killed those five men, your father and those other four men, I saw lights and stars, and I heard that sound, and I didn't know what it was. Uh, Chemo said that. Uh, there was another gal that also said that, and Minkaye as well said that. They got up, to, uh, got up and left the longhouse. Kevin pulled out the CD to find the title of the piece Chemo had identified. He says, you won't believe this. Look, and he pointed to the CD, and the, the number eight of the song was Every Tribe and Every Nation. I can't say that, that happens to every time a martyr dies, but I won't be surprised. Maybe we hear it, maybe we don't. I can tell you right now, the angels hear it. When someone precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Every one of them. And I think this is the last trumpet. We'll all go home. That's it. No more persecution. No more dying. It's all gone. When? How fast is it going to happen? In a twinkling of, of an eye. we got some engineers here in the audience, right? How fast is a twinkling of an eye? Anybody know? The research I saw, the little digging that I did, said about a billionth of a second. So take a second and divide it up into billionths, right? That's a twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen fast. You know, I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen at the speed of obeying Jesus. When Jesus tells an angel to do something, boom, he's gone. It's going to be like that. Jesus says, let's go. We're out. Just like that. Who's first? The dead. Those who are sleeping in Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful term? Sleeping in Jesus. You know, I sit there and watch my wife, and she likes to sleep more than I do. So I'll tell you that. I like watching her sleep. She looks so peaceful. When you know Jesus... And he's taken away the sting of death. He took that law that showed us the sinners that we are. He took that law and all those things are contrary to us. And he nailed them to the cross saying, paid in full. Where's death? Death has lost its sting. Sleeping in Jesus. Those who are sleeping in Jesus, they get to go first. I guess you take the billionth of a second. They're the first half of the billionth of the second. Right? Right? The only way I can think of it. Then what about us? We're caught up next. I don't know. So, some, we have pictures of clothes on the ground. I don't know, my bridge, my caps, and, you know, my bowl. I don't know, fillings will be on the ground. I don't know. I don't care. I'll be with, we'll be with the Lord. And we all get changed bodies. Aren't you looking forward to that? I mean, younger folks don't know as well, but, man, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> This is not getting easier as the days go on. This week has been a, a challenge. This deteriorating, rotting flesh is gone. But he's going to take the dust of the dead bodies of everyone, and he's going to bring them back to life. 
How can he do that? He can speak the world into existence. I don't think this is a hard science problem for the Lord. Fit for heaven. Perfect. New bodies. Never experiencing death or sickness or pain ever again. Bodies that can hug and be hugged. And we're going to eat. We're going to eat. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I did look at John Shepard when I said we're going to eat. John and I have a good time. We like to eat. What's it going to be like? I don't know. It's going to be wonderful. What happens next after the rapture? The judgment seat of Christ. We won't read these passages this morning, but basically what these passages are talking about is a time where, as believers, we stand before Jesus. Did you know you're going to stand before Jesus as a judge? Now, this isn't about whether you're going to be saved or not. You're already saved because you're safe in the blood of Christ. But every true believer has a gift from God. And he's going to say, okay, have a seat. Now, let's talk about that gift I gave you and what would you do with it. You see? I'm a manager at work. I like all the guys that work for me. They do a great job. But we have a review. And we talk about what they've done for the year. Jesus is going to be looking at our lives and saying, okay, I gave you a gift or gifts, what'd you do with them? And it makes sense when you think about it. Because this is the judgment seat of Christ, which many of us believe is going to happen right after the rapture, and the tribulations going on uh, on the earth. But before the Lord judges the unbelievers, where does he start? Judgment starts in the household of God. He's going to start with us first. And he's going to be looking at our lives. And there's stories about the guy who just buries that one little talent because he knows the master is a hard taskmaster and didn't want to lose it. You don't want to end up like that guy. That part of the story doesn't turn out so good. Okay? But it's the judgment seat of Christ where we're going to go before Jesus and he's going to look at our lives and say, what'd you do? And I wonder when he says he'll wipe away every tear if that's not part of it. Some people think it might look like this. Like I said, some cheesy pictures. I kind of hope it's a private or, or affair personally because you know what? The, the, it says the Lord wipe away every tear, you know? It might be me crying. Marriage, supper of the Lamb. Now, before I go on to that, about the, the um, judgment seat of Christ, there's at least five different crowns mentioned. Five different crowns mentioned in the New Testament. The judgment seat of Christ, this is not about what did you not do, but what did you do? Did you know you get to have heaven and rewards on top of that? Wow. Heaven's good enough, but he's going to reward you for service. Reward you for your faithfulness. So what do you do with these crowns? I'll tell you what they're doing in heaven. They're all just throwing them at Jesus. You know, They have a thing in hockey. They call it the hat trick. Everyone just takes their hat and they throw it onto the ice. It's going to be so much better than that. You take crowns and you just toss them and throw them at the Lord. Saying, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Anyway. All right, marriage supper of the lamb. Something that looked like something like this. I thought, you know what? That looks kind of cheesy. I'll be stuck across from one other person or two other people. I might get stuck across from Steve Caldwell, you know. So looking at each other the whole time. Nah, it's gotta be, it can't be like that. It can't be something better than that. Something that might look like this. You know, I, I like the sentiment. I like the idea. It's, it's a marriage supper, right? I'm not sure it'll have a disco ball like this one does. <laughs> you know, I kind of think not. But, but I get the idea. But I get the idea. You know, it's going to be, you know what? It's going to be a party. It's going to be a celebration. Take all the best, holy, good things about a party, if, you, if you've ever had any. And like I said, multiply that times infinity, and it's going to be like that. And we're going to sit down, and we're going to, we're going to be with the one we were, we, were, we were made for and saved for. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord, with the Lord forever. Nothing ever getting in the way. The old man is destroyed. You're no longer struggling with sin. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking so forward to that. Sweet fellowship with Jesus, reigning with him all the time. You're going to see Jesus face to face. Like what Job said. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, 
This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. You know, when he was here, he had no form or comeliness that, you should be, that you'd be drawn to him. He wasn't the Hollywood knockout like he's portrayed in most movies. When he was here, he was kind of plain looking. But in heaven, he's the centerpiece. He's the one that everyone revolves around. He is the beauty, the beautiful one of heaven. It says, I saw the, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, in the midst of them, in the midst of the throne. Who did I see? A lamb, as if it had been slain. You're going to see scars in his hands and his feet and his side, just like Thomas did. Jesus got a new body, but Jesus' body is different. He has scars. He has wounds. And if you think about that, some might think, well, that's the only off-putting thing in heaven. Wounds? Scars? Those are marks of love. You're going to be able to see those for the rest of eternity and know that my Savior loved me so much, he saw the freight train of God's wrath coming, and he stepped down from heaven, and he threw himself across those tracks to save me. And those marks are going to remind us for eternity. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. I hope you find that comforting. Comfort one another with these words. What will the rapture not be? So many people think it'll be a huge world disturbance. I don't know of an end times book or movie that don't start off with the rapture being some cataclysmic event that looks something like this right, where planes are crashing and cars are crashing and, you know, everything is so noticeable. And I'll be honest with you. Jesus says when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? I don't think it's going to be that big of a difference. I think many churches, quote-unquote churches, will go on just like they always did. There won't be that much of a difference. Some will think that uh, the rapture will be a second chance. Well, when I see the rapture, that's when I'll know all the Christians. Right Right now, I'm just sitting in a chair at church just playing the game. But when I see the rapture happen, that's when I know I'll have to get serious. Well, you know what? God will not be mocked. The rapture will not be a second chance to believe the gospel. We're going to see in 2 Thessalonians that those who had a chance to believe the gospel and chose not to, and chose their sin over the truth, they're going to be deluded. So that even the rapture, if it is a cataclysmic event, it won't speak to them. And the author of that delusion won't be Satan. It'll be God himself. It says God will send them a strong delusion. God will not be mocked. God is not playing games. If you know the gospel, today is the day of salvation. It's easy for me to say my dad died at 44. I turned 48 on Friday. It's coming Friday. I'm, I'm four years in overtime. You're not guaranteed today. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. When will it happen? That would be the the obvious question. But of that day and hour, no one knows, Jesus says. Because the day and hour, no one knows. So some people say, well, then we can guess the month and the year. (laughs) I'm like, are you serious? Don't you get the idea? Jesus is saying, you're not going to know. You're not going to know. Nevertheless, people have been trying to guess for, for, for a long time. There was the great disappointment 150 years ago, this guy Miller put out this big thing about when Jesus was coming back. And all these people came to the Lord because Jesus was coming back. And guess what? He didn't. 
And all those people stopped following the Lord. You see, they had no root, no depth. Today is the day of salvation. Now is when we need to know him. All sorts of bad things spun off from that, from different Advent thoughts and people setting dates. It was uh, Wise and Hunt that Alan mentioned, 88 reasons why Jesus would come in 1988, and many of us know about other local date-setting people. You know what the reality is about when Jesus is coming back? It's not about getting ready. It's about being ready. Are you ready now? What can I do to prepare? You need to follow the testimony of Enoch. Hebrews 11.5 says this, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. So if you thought you were the first one to be raptured, looks like not, like Enoch was. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Just walk with the Lord now. Walk with him now. Do what he wants you to do now. So that you can live. He, he died to be Lord. Of both the living and the dead. That's why he died. To be your Lord. If you're going to spend eternity with him now. Or then. Why don't you get used to that. Work on that relationship now. This is what I meant. When I said I hope there's no real big life impact. I hope you're walking with Jesus now. If you're walking with him now. Whether you're going to buy that, that house or move away or that job or pursue that thing or that relationship, it's because of him. You're following him. And say you pursue that today and he comes tomorrow, that's okay. Whatever you're going to do for him in that, in that situation, you get it on credit. You are obeying. Please God, Enoch's testimony. I love what 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Alan spoke to us last week about we're never going to be perfect. We're never going to arrive. Don't let that discourage you. You keep striving that direction. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. We have a time, an opportunity. Right now, we have besetting sins. We have issues. But now is the time to trust the Lord. Because when you see him, you're going to be like him. It's all gone by then. All your opportunity for victory over your sins in Jesus' name, is here and now. This is it. This is why this time is important. Wherever that leech is that's clamped to you, get rid of it. Because you can't take it with you anyway. What else can we do? Oh, I love this verse. Listen to what Jesus says. The context is money. But I think it's more than money. And I say to you, this is, uh, Luke 16, 9, I say to I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Can you imagine what, that's, what that is? The context there is money, but I think we could talk about time. I think we could talk about effort, how much sharing the gospel, either through giving, through literature. Now, I can't imagine what, what, what Pedro's welcoming is going to be like that day. You know, you give literature all over the world or you gave money to, to all over the world. People are going to be in heaven. As you walk into heaven, they're going to say, thank you, I'm here because of you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the gospel with me. I'm here because of you. Thank you for giving to that missionary. I'm here because of you. That's literally what Jesus is saying here. You're going to be welcomed into heaven because the impact that your life, your time, your money, you're sharing the gospel, hat on people. This is it. Knowing the Lord. There's, there's no plan B. We're going to talk about what happens next in the rest of the first part of the next chapter. 
This message today was mostly for believers, as you can tell. And then next week, we'll be talking about the tribulation. As all of us who know the Lord are in heaven, the, the unsaved will be judged on the earth. But hopefully, you've got your mental bags, your mental and spiritual bags packed. Are you ready to go home? Right, let's skip next week's message. Let's just go home. <laughs> Sound good? Yeah, all right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the great hope we have in you. That when you said you will come again and receive us to yourself, that where you are, we might be also. Oh, Lord, we're looking forward to that day. But, Lord, we know that you have us here for a reason and that our obedience brings joy to your heart. Help us to be like Enoch, to be pleasing to you, looking forward to that day. And then when we lose one, we know, Lord, we don't sorrow like those who don't have any hope, that we're all going to see you again face to face. Lord, we look forward to that day. In the meantime, Lord, help us that, that our lives would be conformed to your image as they will be one day. Speak to our hearts now, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.